morning again. What a great day it has been already in our worship. You know, it's Mother's Day, and of course, no mom is perfect, not this mom, not yours, not mine. But I have found in my life, and maybe in yours, that there are some very predictable momisms, or if you will, mommy mantras that are, that are somewhat universal. So from the nagging mom, did you brush your teeth? Isn't it past your bedtime? Repeat, repeat, repeat. From exaggerator mom, clean your plate. There are starving people all over the world who would love to eat your broccoli, right? <laughs> or you, you forgot your head. If it wasn't attached to your shoulder, you would forget it. From predictable mom, if you can stay out late at night, you can get out of bed this morning. And then my favorite, no matter what, I'll always love you. You know, I love the video we showed a few minutes ago, but for, for me, when John and Anna were born, I, I got some new perspective on my mom and the things she did and the things she said. Maybe you're like me. I, I, I remember hearing my mom say things that I laughed at then, but now I know they're true. She was right. I used to roll my eyes on the inside, of course, you know, I, uh, when my mom told me things like, you're only as happy as your most unhappy child. See, now I know that's true. Which reminds me of the description of a godly woman in the Old Testament book of Proverbs. We used it in our call to worship. It says this, say it with me. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Well, we launched this series a couple of weeks ago, and one of the first things we talked about was James himself. It's a very big deal that James was the brother of Jesus, and now James didn't really understand who his big brother was until Jesus died on the cross and then appeared to his brother James. But after that, we know James became this incredible leader in the church. But James also had another incredible spiritual influence in his life, his mom, Mary. You know, we usually only talk about it at Christmas time, but Mary was this faithful Jewish teenager who was engaged to be married in Nazareth, this nothing town. And an angel visited her and told her that she would have a baby. You know, I stopped to think about the wisdom that Mary already had with that earth-shattering and eventually death-shattering news. Mary said this, she said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And of course, as the angel was about to leave in an incredible act of submitting to God's work in her own life, Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be as you have said. That was a mature, faithful, and wise response. After Jesus was born, we know that Mary and Joseph had more children, in, including James. And as I read this, th these words about wisdom today, I can't help but think that God used Mary to help James understand many of the things he wrote about, but especially wisdom. James describes two kinds of wisdom. As you listen, see if you can pick those out. James writes, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done and the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, 
impartial and sincere. May God keep growing us up as we study this book. See, next week we're gonna hear James to distinguish between faith and works. And he's going to tell us that you need both in your life. But here, James draws a deep dividing line between godly wisdom and earthly wisdom. And the kind of wisdom that, that James wants for you will make you an entirely different person than if you have the other kind of wisdom. James starts off describing godly wisdom and he, he gives the key by linking wisdom and understanding. He says, who is wise and understanding. James knows that wisdom starts from understanding. Now, we've heard that before from the book of Proverbs. Read this one with me. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. We know this, you, if we read the scriptures, you can't be wise until you have a right understanding of God. We also know that fearing the Lord is not being afraid that he will zap you. That's not it. It is putting Jesus in his right place. Knowing that he is the one who made all things. Knowing that he is the one who, who rules the universe and deserves to be in charge of your life. Knowing that he loves you so much that he gave his life to you. Now, many of you have seen this illustration before, but I think it's an important one. Uh, this chair uh, represents, this chair represents um, your life. And the one who sits on the throne of your life rules your life. Here's a, 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 a diagram that may help you understand what I'm trying to say. If you are wise, Jesus sits on the throne of your life. Jesus is your leader. Jesus is your forgiver. You look to Jesus. See, where you are is that little person not on the throne looking up to the throne. And Jesus himself is on the throne of your life. You submit to him. He is, as we say when we profess our faith, he is our Lord and our Savior. See, when you understand that, you have wisdom. James says, and if that's true, if you do have wisdom, then Jesus is also going to direct your actions. Your life is going to increasingly reflect him. You're going to grow in your wisdom. Then James describes the other kind of wisdom. Now you can see that phrase in orange there. It actually shows up twice. Uh, let's say it, just say it, that, that phrase with me. Envy and selfish ambition. James says, if you harbor envy and selfish ambition, if you have a Bible at home, always circle repetitive things. You're gonna learn a lot if you see where the writers are repeating. If you have envy and selfish ambition, you have a different kind of wisdom. And it's not good. This kind of wisdom comes from a totally different understanding. See, understanding and, and wisdom are linked and this understanding has been around since creation. From the very beginning, God made people in his own image. He made us to be connected to him and with him for, for forever. But from the very beginning, people wanted to be God rather than be connected to God. In Genesis, God had created this, this world where Adam and Eve were connected to God. And God gave them a, a, a place to rule, good work to do. He gave them each other to live with, but that wasn't enough. Only one tree was off limits for their good. But the serpent came and twisted God's plan and told Adam and Eve, if you eat it, this is what he said, he said, you will not certainly die 
For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so they ate. Now make the connection with me. They had envy of God. They had envy of power. They had selfish ambition to be equal to God so they could be the one in charge. This is the understanding that James says leads to earthly wisdom. So back to the chair. At the heart of this wisdom is an understanding that yourself is on the throne of your life. And that Jesus, represented by the cross, is outside of your life. He doesn't really matter. And he certainly doesn't rule your relationships or your priorities or any part of your life. Well, see, these two kinds of wisdom, two really ways of life, couldn't be more different. And because they're different, they produce two very different paths. I don't know how many of you have been to the, the movies late, lately. I, I can't wait to do that tonight. For Mother's Day, uh, John and Mark are taking me out to lunch and then finally to see the Avengers Endgame. And I mean, I, I've had to stay off Twitter all week because they lifted the spoiler ban, uh, which is, is terrible. And John actually texted me this week and said, hey, don't watch the new Spider-Man trailer because it's gonna ruin the movie for you. And if you know what happened, and we shake hands afterwards, if you tell me, it's gonna be bad news for you. Don't tell me. <laughs> now, but I, I guarantee, after we get to the movie, and after we get our IMAX tickets, we wanted to see this big, Mark will buy us a large drink at one extra large price. Y'all know the story. And we'll buy one cup, and he'll get two straws for us. A little Presbyterian, I know, right? But I love these days the fountain drinks at movie theaters. So many choices, and when you push a button, the drink you pick comes out. Here's a, 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 one of the, the, I don't know if you've seen this, these machines, right? You can get orange Sprite, or cherry Coke, or vanilla Diet Coke. You know, it doesn't take long to figure out how to push the right button to get the drink that you actually want. You don't get cherry Coke when you push orange Sprite. You don't get blue Powerade when you push the red Fanta button. If you have godly wisdom in you, certain things are going to come out of your life. And James says they're predictable. You understand life. You understand the world from God's perspective. And you begin to connect the dots. And it turns into this, this new way of life. See, if you have godly wisdom, wisdom leads to understanding, and the understanding leads to demonstration of a good life. Tim Keller expounds on the way this wisdom changes your perspective. This is what he writes. He says, spiritual wisdom comes whooshing through your life using a very, very important little tool, if then. Do you know what if then means? When I hear somebody say, wait a minute, I always knew God was holy, but if he's holy, I already knew God was loving, but if he's loving, I always knew God Jesus died for me, but if he really did that, then why am I mad? Why am I sad? Why am I living like that? Why do I feel superior? Why do I feel inferior? If this, then. So what's going on? Your, your knowledge, Tim says, is being churned into wisdom. 
That's really what it means to try to grow as a Christian. All of us as Christians have far more knowledge than we have wisdom, and we don't know how it relates. The only reason we're worried, the only reason we sin, the only reason we're upset, the only reason we don't do everything we're supposed to do is because our knowledge hasn't been churned into wisdom. It happens when we say, oh my gosh, if, then. Moms, dads, grandparents, uncles, aunts, if you have wisdom, understanding of God, it will change the way you parent. If Jesus loved me and gave his life for me, then. If Jesus loves my child more than me, then. If God made my child for his purposes, then. If I, by my actions, help my child pursue certain things over God, then. Godly wisdom and earthly wisdom will both bear fruit. Both wisdoms turn into actions and, and lifestyles and decisions. And James tells us what happens with each. He says, earthly wisdom leads to disorder and evil practices. I mean, hear that. It's pretty strong. James doesn't mess around. If you have the wrong kind of wisdom shaping your life, your life will be out of control. And you will never, ever live the life that God has for you. But if you have godly wisdom, that will turn into actions and lifestyles and decisions that are good. And good not just for you. Good for your home. Good for your kids. Good for your neighbors. Good for our city. Now, speaking of our city, we're making some adjustments. I hope you already have this to serve day. We've expanded it to serve week and it's very, very intentional because we want you to use your own serve muscles right where you are every day. So every day we're giving you a different idea where you can put your faith, your godly wisdom into action. And then we'll all join together to serve on Saturday as a sign that we are together and want the city to, to know the love of Jesus. Imagine though, all week, 1,800 of us shining the love of Jesus into our community. You think people would notice? I mean, it's the very best strategy to invite people to know Jesus. Can't wait to see all the ways that you'll serve this week. We're inviting you to let us know your stories and we've got some cards that we'd love for you to take as a, and when you do your act to, to give that card uh, to the person you're doing that or leave that card if you do a note. But what we're praying, what we're hoping is that people will see through us and they'll see Jesus. See, if you and I have been shaped by godly wisdom, good deeds naturally pour out of us. Now we'll talk more about this next week because good deeds, you can't earn your way to Jesus. So the Boy Scout thing, getting better and better doing that, that doesn't get you there. But good deeds should flow out of your life. They're fruit of wisdom. See, wisdom is shown not by words, but by our actions. And we're gonna see the entire book of James over the next few weeks is all about godly wisdom shaping every part of your life. As Mark talked about last week, godly wisdom changes the way you talk. Godly wisdom changes the way you treat people. It changes your priorities. And it will certainly change you, moms, as a mother. 
Now, moms, you're gonna probably get a gift today of some kind for Mother's Day. I hope you are, guys. Get busy. But you can also give one. See, the best gift you could give your children is to share your godly wisdom. And that starts with understanding who belongs in the chair of your life, in the center of your life, on the the throne of your life. And here's some takeaways beyond that. Three things I'd love to you to, to take away and do. Moms, dads, uncles, sisters, all of you, as it comes to relating to our kids. First, ask. Ask God for more godly wisdom. I mean, we've already heard that in the first chapter, James says, if you lack wisdom, go ahead and ask. Because God wants to give it to you. He's not withholding. He wants you to have it. And he wants it to make you more and more like Jesus. He wants it to make you more and more wise. Second one, teach. There are two parts of teaching. Sometimes, moms, it's easy to teach with our words and a lot more harder to teach with our actions. Do both. Let them see you speaking godly wisdom, but also let them see you living godly wisdom. The last one, pray that your children will have it. As the mom, you are in a very unique position. See, there's no one on the earth who knows your children better than you do. You know when they've drifted away. You know when they skin their knee and you know when their hearts are are broken. You know their relationships, you, you know their dreams. And so you have this incredible privilege. Don't give this one away. You've got this privilege to pray that they would put Jesus on the throne of their life and that Jesus would give them wisdom and that that wisdom would shape the decisions they make. We all know it's a a very complicated world we live in where school shootings have become normal. And in our own community where 50% of the people claim no faith connection, There is so much to pray about. But what I know is we need a generation of children who have this kind of wisdom. And that would change Bethlehem. That would change the valley. And that, my friends, would change the world. Ask, teach, pray. May it be so. Let's pray together. God, we need godly wisdom that starts with this understanding of who you are and who we are because of your love for us. And only you can give it to us. We want this wisdom. We want to be wise women. We want to be wise men so that we can live our lives on display to show the world your love and your grace. God, I pray if there are any here who've never put Jesus on the throne of their life, I'm praying that by your spirit that they would say yes and they would invite you, Jesus, to be the center of their life. Do your work in each of us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.